Hello everyone and welcome to this session on Pediatric Radiology Case-Based Review. My name is Anjum Bandarkar and I am a Pediatric Radiologist at the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group in Virginia. And what I'd like to do in this session is to review some critical findings, particularly seen with ultrasound in the setting of pediatric emergencies. I have no relevant disclosures. I will be using a case-based approach to describe sonographic features of some common pediatric emergency conditions, and I will also discuss practical tips and tricks to recognize pitfalls and mimics. We know that other imaging like plane radiographs and cross-sectional imaging may be required as an adjunct, but ultrasound remains the first go-to modality when it comes to evaluating children and it is often sufficient to make an accurate diagnosis. Our first case is a four-week-old baby boy came in with emesis after every feed. These are grayscale images of the pylorus in the longitudinal and transverse plane depicting an abnormally thickened pylorus. On real-time exam, the gastric antrum was distended with fluid and contents and the pyloric channel was nicely visualized however no contents were able to pass across the pyloric channel thereby establishing a diagnosis of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is a common condition affecting young infants in which the antropyloric portion of the stomach becomes abnormally thickened and there is an obstruction to gastric emptying. This is a pretty thickened pylorus as we see. It is not present at birth but mechanical obstruction typically develops in the first 2 to 12 weeks of life and the treatment is surgical pyloromyotomy. The infant presents with a recent onset of forceful non-bilious emesis, typically projectile vomiting. Dehydration and weight loss are often present, and hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis is the characteristic biochemical abnormality because emesis of gastric contents leads to depletion of sodium, potassium, and hydrochloric acid. This is a normal pylorus in three different newborns. They're all normal and these pretty images have been produced using this amazing high-frequency linear transducer. On real-time exam, this is what a normal pylorus looks like. So let's go slow. This is the gastric antrum and the contents are passing through the channel emptying into the duodenum. Let's look at the sonographic anatomy of a normal pylorus. Being a part of the GI tract, the pylorus demonstrates the classic gut signature composed of five layers. Starting from the innermost, this is the lumen and antrum, the innermost to outermost. The first layer is the echogenic mucosa. Next is a thin hypoechoic muscle layer, that's the muscularis mucosa. Then comes the dense echogenic submucosa. Next is the muscularis externa, and finally the serosa, which may be imperceptible. An abnormal pylorus also demonstrates the same five layers, except that the muscularis externa is markedly thickened. The criteria that we use to call a pylorus abnormal are wall thickness, muscle thickness greater than 3 mm, and pyloric channel length greater than 15 mm. Now let's take a look at some pitfalls in the diagnosis of pyloric stenosis. This is an infant who had a scan performed where the pyloric muscle was measured at 3.2 millimeter thickness and called equivocal. However, the images weren't as impressive and therefore a repeat scan was performed. And at this time, the muscle thickness was measured at 1.5 millimeter thickness correctly and the channel length was 9 millimeters long and it was called normal. So what is different between these two images? This exam was performed with a linear 9 transducer, a 9 megahertz probe, and this was performed with a higher frequency linear 615 megahertz probe. The images were produced in a transverse 
plane and here they were in a longitudinal plane which allows for the layers to be seen more clearly. On this image the entire muscle thickness was measured including the submucosa whereas here only the outermost muscle thickness was measured excluding the submucosa. Another pitfall is when the stomach is over distended the pylorus can flip posteriorly and it may be hard to find like it's in this example it is going vertically down whereas here it's completely flipped on itself backwards and it looks like this and that's just a transverse image. A third pitfall is the GE junction. Uh, remember they are situated very close to each other in the upper abdomen and in this example the GE junction is in longitudinal plane and transverse plane but since we knew that there is an enteric tube going through it it was easy to tell. It is not uncommon that if a sonographer is new they might mistake the GE junction for the pylorus. This is an example of both the GE junction and pylorus in the same picture in the same infant. So you see how close they are located. Um, but remember the GE junction will be closer to the base of the heart. You can see the heart beating oftentimes and the pylorus will be a little farther away close to the stomach antrum. Look for the landmarks. This is an example of a child who came in with a distended abdomen. On his x-ray there was massive gastric distension and the stomach looked like it was mottled bubbly in appearance and it was concerning for nematosis. There was also linear branching lucencies over the liver suggestive of portal venous gas. He was having emesis and therefore received an ultrasound which showed pyloric stenosis he was positive and also there was these there were these echogenic foci of air in the gastric wall suggesting nematosis so this is only to create an awareness that pyloric stenosis is a benign cause of gastric nematosis and portal venous gas and it often it resolves after pyloromyotomy so if you look at the sequence of events, what happens exactly is because of the stenosis, there is a mechanical gastric outlet obstruction, which leads to increased intraluminal pressure in the stomach. That eventually forces the gas through the intact gastric mucosa into the venules, and they then drain into the veins, eventually draining into the portal venous gas. That's how the gas gets through the venules into the portal venous system. Finally, our take-home points. Recognize that the muscularis externa is the outermost hypoechoic muscle layer that should be measured for pyloric stenosis and that the submucosa should be excluded, otherwise you will end up over measuring the muscle thickness. Using a linear high frequency transducer is best to optimize visualization of the layers of the pyloric wall. And finally, when the pylorus is normal, and there is a strong history of emesis, remember to evaluate the midline mesenteric vessels to look for a whirlpool sign which may indicate malrotation or volvulus. Such as in this case, this was a two-year-old baby who had abdominal pain and you can almost see the mesenteric vessels and the bowel swirling going in a whirlpool on this image. Um, this child did end up getting an upper GI exam that demonstrated malrotation. Our next case is a three-year-old boy with two weeks of abdominal pain and fever. His ultrasound was performed. Um, the appendix was not definitively identified. However, they did describe what looked like a fluid-filled distended area behind the bladder in the retrovesical region right here. and. Um, he was admitted based on his clinical findings, but his condition didn't improve overnight. So the next morning he received a CT scan. And on the CT scan, you can clearly see a thick walled rim enhancing fluid collection in the pelvis that corresponds to what we had initially thought to be a distended rectum. This was a pelvic abscess and this echogenic focus here was the appendical lith. So this turned out to be a perforated appendicitis with a pelvic abscess. 
Now here is a more classic inflamed acute appendicitis with a dilated debris filled appendix and a classic target sign on transverse images with increased echogenicity of the surrounding mesentery suggestive of mesenteric edema. On real time exam, um, you could also see some free fluid in the pelvis with edema of the bowel loops and that is the inflamed appendix uh, up here. This is another example of an acute appendicitis with shaggy thick walled appendix with surrounding mesenteric edema and this is what it looks like on real time exam. This is a normal appendix with gut signature and the diameter is measured from outer to outer wall. It is typically less than six millimeter. Um, often it is air filled and you can find it draped around the iliac vessels. This is another normal appendix and another normal appendix. This is a cine sweep showing a normal appendix in the right lower quadrant. Um, here it comes and sometimes you may see just a transverse section of it. But notice how the surrounding fascial planes are clean. There is no mesenteric edema or fluid and the appendix is normal in size. Compared to what we just saw, this is a completely opposite picture. This is a 12 year old girl who came in with seven days of fever and abdominal pain and the bowel is already thickened. There is significant mesenteric edema. You can see the inflamed appendix and she had a six centimeter abscess. This was a perforated appendicitis. Um, when you have the appendicolith, the shadowing appendicolith can be really helpful in getting your attention to the surrounding inflamed appendix. Um, in, this, in this example, this child had a small appendical lid, but it was enough to catch our attention and clinch the diagnosis of appendicitis. So for our take home points, know how to find the normal appendix, measure the diameter correctly from outer to outer wall. An appendical lid can be a great clue to appendicitis and look for other supporting signs like mesenteric edema, free fluid, bowel wall thickening and fluid collections in the pelvis. A categorical approach to appendicitis may be used to help guide the management after an ultrasound. So for example, if it is a category one, it means it is seen and normal, so the child may go home. If it's a category four, it means that the appendix was seen and abnormal, so needs further definitive management. If it's a category two. It means the appendix was not visualized, but there are no supporting signs to suggest appendicitis. And then the category three is the important one where you don't see the appendix, but there are certain supporting signs that tell us that this child may need additional cross-sectional imaging in the form of a CT scan, or if the kid is older above five years, then maybe an MRI to look for appendicitis. Moving on, our next case is a six month old boy with bilious emesis. His abdomen radiograph was read as mild stool retention. And because of his history of bilious emesis, he received an upper GI exam, which was normal. There's no malrotation. He was admitted overnight for observation and had a red current jelly stool and that's when an abdomen ultrasound was obtained that demonstrated a classic ileocolic intersusception. This is the concentric bowel sign or donut sign and the pseudo kidney sign in longitudinal plane. He was sent for an air enema reduction. Now while doing the air enema you could see the ileocolic intersusception in the transverse colon outlined by air and uh, during the reduction this was pushed down now it's in the ascending colon and finally completely reduced with air in the small bowel looking back this was the ileocolic intersusception on the plane radiograph and this is the meniscus sign where you have an intraluminal mass surrounded by a column of air that's stomach and that's transverse colon. So our take home points, don't let bilious emesis trick you into going for an upper GI. 
because any cause that anything that causes distal bowel obstruction can present with bilious emesis and recognize the meniscus sign of intersusception on plain abdomen radiograph. This is another two-year-old boy who came in with three days of frequent non-bilious emesis. And on the x-rays, there was just paucity of bowel gas in the lower abdomen. But his ultrasound was classic for the crescent and donut sign. That's the fatty crescent and the pseudo-kidney sign with some free intraperitoneal fluid. He also had an air enema reduction and it was successfully reduced. Um, but it recurred times three over a span of 12 days. He had three recurrences. Finally, he was taken to the OR and his pathology showed a hamartomatous polypoid lesion of the ileum, which was the lead point for the intersusception. Here is a nine-month-old boy with three days of abdominal pain and lethargy and increasing distension. His abdomen radiograph on presentation showed small bowel obstruction. He did have an ileocolic intersusception that was pretty low in the pelvis with free fluid and trapped fluid between the layers of the intersusception. He went on to get an air enema reduction to see if we could even move this intersusception further up and it we were able to push it back to the level of the mid-transverse colon but it did not reduce any further and the child proceeded to surgery. He had a laparotomy with manual reduction of the ileocolic intersusception that had reached the sigmoid colon and no lead point was identified. So this was an atypical intersusception because of his unusually low position at presentation. This is a two-year-old boy who presented with intermittent abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. On his exam, there was a 3-centimeter polypoid mass in the mid-abdomen adjacent to an intersusception. And this is the longitudinal image showing the mass and the adjacent intersusception. Um, on cine sweeps, it looked like the mass and the intersusception were closely connected with each other. There we go. He went on to get an air enema reduction for the ileocolic intersusception, and it was successful. There was air in the small bowel at the end of the procedure, suggesting that the ileocolic intersusception had reduced. However, you could still see the intraluminal mass. Um, he went on to get a follow-up ultrasound that showed the polypoid mass in the colon, and this time the vascular stalk was better seen because the intersusception had reduced by now. This was a colocolic intersusception, secondary to a polyp, and it turned out to be a juvenile polyp in the hepatic flexure. Now for some mimics of intersusception. This is a child who came in with abdominal pain and had this concentric intersusception in the right lower quadrant, but the diameter was only 2 centimeters, and this was an ileoileal or small bowel intersusception. It reduced spontaneously, and these are often known to be transient. The differentiating point from ileocolic intersusception is the outer to outer diameter in an ileocolic intersusception is typically 3 centimeters or greater, whereas in a small bowel intersusception, it's smaller than 2 centimeters. Another mimic is um, an eight-month-old boy who came in with urinary retention and constipation. He was already diagnosed as having intersusception at an outside facility, and he was transferred for reduction. On his repeat ultrasound at our institute, we saw a pelvic mass with some bladder wall thickening, and it was fairly low. This is the lumbosacral spine, and uh, this did not look like a classic intersusception. So because of the suspicion of mass, he received a CT scan that did demonstrate a solid pelvic mass. This was a catheter, Foley catheter introduced to decompress the bladder, um, urinary bladder, and the mass was confirmed on a follow-up MRI the next day. This turned out to be a pelvic rhabdomyosarcoma. So as far as intersusception is concerned, some learning points. Typical intersusception occurs between 6 to 36 months of age. It is idiopathic, which means there's no lead point. It is ileocolic, classically in right lower quadrant, and the classic clinical triad of symptoms, which includes the colicky pain, current jelly stool, and palpable abdominal mass may be seen. Atypical intersusception presents at extremes of ages. It is longer in duration. 
very often recurrent and fluoroscopic reduction often fails. On imaging, atypical intersusception is typically distal in location, way beyond the splenic flexure. Free intraperitoneal fluid and trapped fluid in the layers of the intersusception are often seen. It may present with small bowel obstruction and there is often a lead point causing the intersusception. So our take home points, Note the differences between the typical and atypical presentations as well as the clinical features to make an accurate diagnosis and ultrasound is extremely sensitive to confirm the presence, location and the type of intersusception, iliocolic versus ilioilial. Our next case is a 22 month old girl with crampy abdominal pain and vomiting. She had a classic concentric bowel mass suggesting iliocolic intersusception in the right mid-abdomen. On her ultrasound exam, there was some trapped fluid in the layers of the intersusception and also some free fluid that is not well shown here. She had a positive intersusception at 14 months of age that had reduced spontaneously in her past history. She went on to receive an air enema reduction and the intersusception was partially reducible to the level of the ileocecal valve. But um, since it didn't progress, we decided to use contrast, positive contrast, in the hope that it would push it further across, but it stayed and the filling defect persisted. So this was a failed fluoroscopic reduction and she proceeded to surgery. On her surgery, they found an ileocolic intersusception secondary to a Meckel's diverticulum. Now, we did not find the Meckel's prospectively, but this is a known presentation of Meckel's. A Meckel's can act as a lead point and present with bowel intersusception. I just wanted you to be aware of this and look carefully for a Meckel's as a potential lead point the next time you see an intersusception. This is a companion case where we had a 10 month old boy come in with a bloody bowel movements and his ultrasound exam was impressive. He had a tubular blind ending fluid filled structure in the right mid abdomen. It had gut signature and there were thickened irregular walls, some free fluid in the peritoneum and the best part was he had a normal appendix that was seen separately in the right lower abdomen. This is a transverse cine sweep from top to bottom in the right mid abdomen showing the tubular thick wall structure which we thought was the Meckel's diverticulum. So some bowel loops, free fluid, this is the Meckel's and the liver next to it. So because our suspicion was so high he went on to get a Meckel scan and you see the increased radio tracer uptake focus in the mid abdomen. This was a positive Meckel scan. So this was classic for Meckel's diverticulitis. He got laparoscopic surgery the next day and did very well. These are two different children with similar presentations and similar findings. They showed up a couple days apart, so we kind of learned from the first case and used our knowledge to apply for the other. This two-year-old boy had come in with intermittent abdominal pain for a month and emesis, and he had had three prior negative ultrasound exams. On our scan, we saw a tubular cystic focus in the left lower quadrant. He did not have any supporting signs of appendicitis in the right lower abdomen, and this cystic structure caught our eye because even though it looked similar to the adjacent fluid filled bowel loops, it kind of stayed where it was. It didn't move and it did not peristalse like the remaining bowel loops. So in this cine sweep, you can see the cystic structure in focus and the surrounding bowel loops kind of peristalsing around. So our suspicion was high for Meckel's because his right lower quadrant was negative and he went on to get a Meckel scan and it was positive. This is the increased radio tracer uptake in the left lower abdomen. He got surgery the next day and did well. This three-year-old girl had a similar presentation with intermittent abdominal pain for two weeks and it was only by luck, by chance, that we came upon this thick wall tubular cystic area in the lower abdomen. There was some hyperemia in its walls and it also did not show peristalsis. It kind of stayed put between the surrounding bowel loops and that kind of led to a suspicion for Meckel's. She was also positive for Meckel's diverticulum on surgery. 
So our take-home points for Meckel's, it is the most common congenital anomaly of the GI tract and often presents early in childhood. Clinical presentations include rectal bleeding, intersusception, small bowel obstruction, and diverticulitis. And we've seen a couple of classic and not so classic presentations on imaging. And finally, TEC-99 protectinitate scintigraphy is a highly accurate tool that diagnoses an inflamed Meckel's diverticulum. Now let's move on to another critical topic. A 16-year-old boy came in with acute right groin pain and vomiting. On his ultrasound exam, there was fairly symmetric appearance of the right and the left testes in terms of the size, echotexture, and preserved flow on both sides. But he did have what looked like a hypoechoic soft tissue mass that was separate from his testis and epididymis. This is the head, body, and tail of the right epididymis. And it looked like loosely bunched up spermatic cord structures. On color Doppler exam, there was no hyperemia, but there was also like a roundish configuration to the cord structures. On real-time cine sweeps, you could almost see the actual twisting of the spermatic cord adjacent to the testis. So testis, that's the twisting of the cord, and some reactive hydrocele. He was diagnosed with acute right testicular torsion with preserved flow and went on to get bilateral pexy and the testis was salvageable. A companion case, this is a 13-year-old boy with acute left testicular pain. On his buddy shot image, you can see symmetric vascularity and echotexture of both testes. This was the right and the left side looked fairly symmetric. And he also had what looked like redundant loops of spermatic cord in the superolateral aspect of his testis. On the cine sweep, you could see the actual twisting off the spermatic cord in the right groin and he too was diagnosed with acute testicular torsion with preserved vascularity. Now in retrospect these are the loops of the redundant spermatic cord in the left side that uh, were seen on the buddy shot image. This is another companion case where a 14-year-old boy who woke up with acute left-sided pain came in and got an exam that showed symmetric texture and size and vascularity in both testes, but he too had what looked like a whirlpool sign of the left spermatic cord that was twisting in the groin. On the cine sweep, you could see the left cord with a twist and some reactive hydrocele and this was also acute torsion with preserved flow. So the take home point here is the presence of testicular flow should not deter you from calling this as an acute torsion. This is a 17-year-old boy who came in with acute right testicular pain and he had had similar episodes in the past that had resolved spontaneously. His exam was remarkable for asymmetry. His right testis did look globular and enlarged and edematous compared to the left side that was more slender. There was incidental microlithiasis. Um, on color Doppler exam, there was symmetric vascularity, except that there was a little bit of a reactive hydrocele on the right side. On cine sweeps, you could see redundant loops of spermatic cord in the right scrotum. There it is. And uh, on the longitudinal images, that's the right cord that just looked like it was loosely bunched up. Um, so we knew we were dealing with a bell clapper anomaly. Now while we we're scanning, he said his pain had suddenly improved and that he felt much better. It was gone. So we looked again with color and there was indeed increased vascularity in the edematous right testis, which means we were dealing with a spontaneous detorsion. He did go home that day and got surgery about 10 days later. He had a bilateral orchiopexy and a good outcome. So this was intermittent testicular torsion with preserved flow. This is a 15-year-old boy who was unfortunately not as lucky. He did come in with five days of pain and there was virtually no vascularity in the left testis. There was a little bit of reactive hydrocele and you could see the twisting of the left cord. On the cine sweep, you could see the left spermatic cord torsion. That's the cord twisting, and that's the edematous left testis. There we go. 
This is another 16 year old boy who came in with one week of right groin pain and he had virtually no flow with in fact very heterogeneous looking right testis that almost um, looked like it was already beginning to necrose. There was some peripheral pudendal flow but unfortunately neither of these were salvageable. Let's take a minute to understand the bell clapper anomaly. So normally the epididymis, the green structure, extends along the full length of the testis from the superior to the inferior pole and the tunica is anchored to the epididymis. However, in a bell clapper anomaly, there is an abnormally high attachment of the tunica to the spermatic cord such that the entire testis epididymis and the spermatic cord is encircled by this tunica and this complex is then left to rotate freely on its own axis and lead to intravaginal torsion. This posterior attachment is missing and that's the cause for the intravaginal torsion. To summarize, testicular torsion is a urologic emergency that unfortunately is missed more often than we'd like. And that is why I'd like each one of you to perfect your sonographic search pattern for testicular torsion. We know that time is testes. One of the questions coming to mind is, is there a time beyond which we can safely presume that the testis is dead and we don't need to rush to accommodate emergent imaging and management? The answer is no. We know that the rates of salvage are higher the sooner the presentation and intervention after the onset of pain but let us not forget that salvage depends not only on the degree of testicular torsion or the length of time of torsion but also on how tightly the cord is twisted so a testis might become non-viable as early as four hours after a 720 degrees twist or it might remain viable for several days, even weeks, if the torsion is incomplete. These are the sonographic features that are highly concerning for testicular torsion. Globular enlargement, heterogeneous echo texture, altered or horizontal lie, a spermatic cord whirlpool sign. If you're lucky, you could see the actual twisting. But more often, you'll just see this redundant, loosely bunched up spermatic cord or what we call a, an enlarged epididymal cord complex without hyperemia. A differential condition to keep in the back of your mind is testicular appendage torsion, when you will see an enlarged avascular nodular area in the superior aspect of the testis. These are two different patients, and um, they both were diagnosed with testicular appendage torsion. The good thing is it is a self-limiting condition and can be managed conservatively. In several retrospective reviews of pediatric patients who presented to the ER with acute scrotal pain, the incidence of appendage torsion ranged from 46 to 71 percent and represented the most common cause of scrotal pain in prepubertal children. Another differential to consider in acute scrotum is epididymitis or chitis. This is a six-year-old boy who came in with acute right groin pain and right scrotal swelling. You can see obvious increased edema and thickening of the right scrotal wall compared to the left side. Right testis and epididymis are enlarged. The epididymis was traced in its entire extent from the head, body, tail, and it was thickened and very hyperemic. And uh, importantly, the cord was completely straight and could be followed through the canal. There was no torsion. So this was acute epididymitis or chitis. So here are take home points. Presence of intratesticular flow does not exclude torsion. Presence of redundant spermatic cord within the scrotum is highly suspicious for torsion. And look for that enlarged epididymal cord complex because that will tell you that where the torsion knot is. It is more frequently identified compared to the classic whirlpool sign. Astute analysis of the cord is key in preventing overdiagnosis of epididymitis. And salvage can be virtually unpredictable depending on how tightly or loosely the cord is twisted. So surgery should not be delayed once the diagnosis of torsion is established even if the time to presentation exceeds the 6 to 10 hour window.
Our next case is a 16-year-old girl with one day of pelvic pain. On her ultrasound exam, um, the left ovary was seen enlarged. There was a hemorrhagic cyst, and you could see some spaced out follicles in the periphery of the ovary. It was sitting in the midline on top of the bladder, which was odd, but there was flow present. And uh, compared to the normal right side, that ovary just looked way too big. The volumes were in fact like 12 times that of the right side. So combining all these features, the midline location, the enlargement, presence of hemorrhagic cysts, spaced out follicles, and increased volumes um, 12 times that of the normal side led to the diagnosis of acute left ovarian torsion secondary to the hemorrhagic cyst. She did go to the OR and get detorsed successfully and her pain improved. This is another young lady with acute pelvic pain for two days. She was sexually active and her TV exam showed an enlarged edematous right ovary compared to the left side. On cine sweeps, you can see the right ovary is way edematous and enlarged with spaced out follicles and the transverse cine sweep demonstrated the asymmetry between the right and the left sides. Again, that's the midline uterus and the right ovary here is enlarged compared to the normal left side. She was diagnosed with acute right ovarian torsion and, get, and got surgery appropriately with detorsion and salvage. This is a 16-year-old who presented with acute right lower quadrant pain and nausea. She had a simple cystic area adjacent to the right ovary and um, the entire right ovary and the cyst looked like they were sitting on top of the bladder in the midline. Um, the left ovary was normal and in comparison to the left, the right looked a little enlarged and edematous. This is a sagittal image showing the bladder, the cyst and the ovary and the cine sweep in the midline transverse plane shows the enlarged ovary, the adjacent cyst sitting on top of the bladder. So superior to inferior ovary, cyst, and bladder. She was diagnosed as acute right adnexial torsion times two at the infundibular pelvic ligament, and it was secondary to an eight centimeter cyst in the mesosalpings. She was taken to the OR and uh, the cyst was resected and the ovary was detorsed, had a good outcome. This is a 17-year-old girl who came in with acute right lower abdominal pain and nausea. She already got a CT scan first to rule out acute appendicitis. It was negative. The appendix was normal, but that's where they picked up the adnexal mass. So she got an ultrasound and the left ovary was normal. The right ovary was seen in part and whatever was seen looked normal, but there was this adjacent right adnexal cystic mass with what looked like one dominance simple cyst and additional smaller cystic areas and those smaller cystic areas looked like they had these tiny folds on the inside so that kind of led to the suspicion that they are likely tubal in origin on a real time exam the right adnexal mass was seen to be comprised of the dominant cystic component as well as these tiny cystic areas um, and on probe pressure it looked like the ovary was separable from the mass. So in applying probe pressure, the adnexal mass moved away from the right ovary. So we call this uh, a tubal torsion. And she went to the OR and the right fallopian tube was torsed times two with a five centimeter paratubal cyst. This next patient was an adult woman, not a pediatric case, but I'm showing it because she had a classic finding that I'd like to share. She came in with acute pelvic pain and she had had a history of ovarian cysts in the past. She had multiple fibroids and you could see a part of the ovary um, that was labeled as right ovary and there was a what looked like a dermoid cyst in the right adnexa. But the other ovary was not seen on ultrasound and because of her pain she went on to get a pelvic MRI and on the MR you could see the dermoid, the ovarian fibroids, the bladder and what looked like a normal right ovary. So if the right ovary was normal, that means all of this was arising from the left ovary. And no wonder we didn't see one on ultrasound. These are sagittal images of her pelvis and we're going from right to left and back. 
and you're seeing the fibroids, the dermoid, and the right ovary. So one more time, we're going from right to left. So we start, that's the right ovary, the dermoid, and then what looks like the ovarian twisted pedicle of the left and keep going, coming back to the right side. So this was the twisted ovarian pedicle of the left ovary and this was the MRI whirlpool sign. She had a diagnosis of acute left ovarian torsion secondary to the 6 centimeter dermoid cyst and she was treated appropriately in a timely fashion. So let's summarize. Torsion may involve the ovary or fallopian tube or both. It could be complete or incomplete and intermittent torsion is common. It affects young girls and young women of reproductive age group. In children, the predisposing factors could be a congenitally long uterovarian ligament, excessive laxity, and extrinsic causes like functional cysts or teratomas. And the fact that they have a small uterus allows more space for the adnexa to twist on its axis. It is important to have a high index of suspicion, especially with a normal appearing ovary and an adjacent adnexal cyst on the ipsilateral painful side. The literature tells us that only about 30% will have an accurate preoperative diagnosis of adnexal torsion. So how can we improve on that? Here are some pearls. Grayscale findings are critical. Do not rush to put on color. We know that presence of ovarian flow does not rule out torsion because 60% of the times the ovary may have a dual arterial blood supply. Think torsion when you see asymmetric enlargement of one ovary compared to the other. Size does matter. The median volume of a torsed ovary has been reported to range between 3 to 10 times of the contralateral side. Midline or supravesical location of the ovary or adnexal cyst should be a red alert that something is out of place. There may be an associated hemorrhagic cyst in the ovary or a dermoid or adjacent tubular cystic area suggesting fallopian tube dilation and these could all be lead points. There may be free fluid which could be reactive to the ongoing torsion or hemorrhagic fluid. And if you're really lucky, you could actually see the twisting pedicle sign or the whirlpool sign. Our next case is a two-month-old baby girl who came in with a left groin bulge. On exam, she had a left inguinal hernia. This is the fascial defect at the left internal inguinal ring. And the hernia sac was noted to contain some fluid, omentum, what looked like a normal ovary, and the uterus. You can recognize the uterus from the endometrial stripe. Let's look at a transverse cine sweep of the left inguinal hernia from superior to inferior. Fluid, omentum, uterus, ovary, and ovary. So it looks like everything was in the sac. Uterus, ovary number one, and ovary number two. It looks like both ovaries were in the sac. This um, child did get a definitive hernia repair at three months of age. Interestingly, she was a 29-week preemie and one of twins, and both of these are known predisposing factors for inguinal hernia. These are some companion cases. Um, this is a three-month-old boy who came in with a right-sided scrotal swelling and refusing feeds. And you can see that there was an inguinal hernia containing air-filled bowel loops. The testis was fine. This seven-year-old boy had a left inguinal bulge that was intermittent. And you could see like squishy, echogenic soft tissue um, popping in and out of the inguinal canal into the scrotal sac. This was omental hernia. And this was just another um, four month old with a left groin swelling and a normal appearing ovary in the hernia. And this is just a cool case showing the appendix entering the hernia sac. Um, it was a normal appendix with some fluid and omentum. And this is an example of an amiant hernia containing the normal appendix. So our take home points, inguinal hernia is the most common cause of groin bulge in children. In female infants, the hernia sac often contains reproductive organs.
The dynamic nature of ultrasound can help assess reducibility of the hernia, and it plays a critical role in preoperative evaluation of children with groin swelling. Our next case is a 14-year-old boy with seven days of sore throat and odynophagia. He got an ultrasound of his neck, and the ultrasound shows um, a normal submandibular gland. This is the right tonsil, and it looks like it's enlarged. And there is a focal, irregularly marginated hypoechoic fluid collection along the posterior lateral aspect of the tonsil. It was confirmed to be a peritonsillar abscess as seen on the CT scan. And on bedside drainage, 4 cc's of pus was obtained. So this was a right peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar infections are common in children and adolescents. But due to the similar clinical presentation, differentiation of peritonsillar abscess from peritonsillar cellulitis or uncomplicated tonsillitis can be very challenging based on clinical exam alone. And this distinction is critical because the management of these entities is different. Traditionally, contrast-enhanced CT scan has been used to diagnose peritonsillar abscess. However, it is far from ideal due to the radiation exposure, and that is why there has been increasing utilization of ultrasound as the primary imaging modality to evaluate neck infections. This is an example of a normal tonsil ultrasound the right and the left side. This is performed using a transcutaneous approach in the submandibular region. The transducer is placed beneath the jaw over the skin and um, on the right side you see a normal submandibular gland and the tonsil that looks like a hypoechoic ovoid soft tissue area with subtly lobulated margins and a striated appearance and specks of air in the medial aspect, that is air in the pharynx. Similarly, the left submandibular gland and a normal left tonsil are visualized. These are images uh, depicting the technique of performing tonsil ultrasound. This is a midline submental approach showing both tonsils side by side. This is a submandibular approach, transverse view, and a submandibular longitudinal approach. This is an example of a five-year-old child with normal tonsils. This is the midline approach and the left submandibular approach showing the normal left submandibular gland, normal left tonsil, and part of the tongue medially. On a cine sweep, you can see the left submandibular gland and the tonsil beneath it. And this is an example of a midline view demonstrating both tonsils. And these are examples of pathologies you may encounter while performing tonsil ultrasound. In this case, the tonsil is moderately enlarged relative to the size of the submandibular gland. However, the echo texture is preserved with its striations. There are no fluid collections. So this is uncomplicated tonsillitis. In a case of peritonsillar cellulitis, the tonsil is typically enlarged and heterogeneous in appearance with patchy hypo and hyperechoic areas and some surrounding edema. And this is a peritonsillar abscess where you see a marginated fluid collection along the posterior lateral aspect of the tonsil. This is the right submandibular gland, the right tonsil abscess, and part of the tongue. So in summary, Tonsil ultrasound is an ideal diagnostic tool for evaluation of tonsils in children for all of these wonderful reasons. It reliably differentiates peritonsillar abscess from other tonsillar infections like uncomplicated tonsillitis, and it plays a critical role in identifying those patients who will not need surgical intervention. Thank you very much for your time and attention.